Uh, this is, uh, as you know, the last session of the day, but um, this is helping grow local markets. And we have uh, Birch Bragg, who is a passionate co-owner and operator of local food hubs and a pizza uh, establishment. And uh, he had the, the pizzas here for the sessions on, uh, what was it, Thursday. Thursday yeah. And they were incredible. So uh, go ahead and uh, put a plug in for him. But he and his wife, Michelle, um, close friends, were, uh, they started this venue to build a more robust and resilient local food economy. Birch entered the local food space in 2013 with Beachmont Farms and Bowling Green and joined the West Six Brewing Company and it's been as passionate to establish local markets. Gordon. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. Folks, thanks for having me. Thanks to Oak for having such a great conference and uh, for you guys for hanging in here in the last session. Uh, always wonderful to be surrounded by such amazing producers and aspiring producers. Uh, nothing short of inspiring. Uh, it fills up our hope bucket, makes us inspired in the winter time to carry on through the, the upcoming season. So thank you guys for coming in to listen to me talk. Uh, over the next 45 minutes, I want to talk to you about uh, exploring markets, additional markets for your products, about working with restaurants, grocery stores, uh, about uh, expanding your brand awareness if you have products that you're looking to sell. Uh, and as another piece, I'd like to talk to you about food advocacy and kind of how we can all participate in being advocates in our local community to push, uh, push local food in the area. Those are kind of the things I want to talk about. Uh, and then the last 15 minutes, I'd like to open it up to questions. Um, and please, throughout this presentation, uh, please don't hesitate to ask questions. Just raise your hand. I'll be glad to call on you. Uh, I do like feedback. This is going to be more of a discussion, not a statistic-heavy presentation. Um, so uh, please do. Don't hesitate to ask any questions. Um, one thing I would like to uh, glean from everybody in the room, I always like to know who I'm talking with and who our audience is. Um, if you could, with a show of hands, um, show, raise up your hand if you are an existing established producer, meaning uh, you rely on at least a percentage or all of your income for uh, selling into diversified markets, farmers markets, CSAs, uh, wholesale institutions. Raise them a little bit higher if you could. All right, nice. About a third of the room, maybe half. Uh, what if you are an aspiring producer, maybe you haven't started selling yet, but you got a piece of land, you're looking to actually generate some revenue, even if it's part-time revenue? Nice. About 25% of the room. Um, and what about facilitators, nonprofits, extension service agents? Um, cool, got a few of you in here. And what about just consumers who just like to support local food? All right, cool. I like it. Good mix of people in here. Uh, we have stuff that can apply to everybody. Um, okay, so just a brief introduction about myself. Um, so I am, um, I am Birch Bragg, as David uh, pointed out. Uh, we, my wife and I and a couple partners, we started Locals Food Hub and Pizza Pub here in Frankfort, Kentucky in July of 2021. Uh, to back up a little bit, uh, I was raised on a farm here in Kentucky, in Metcalf County, South Central Kentucky. My parents were not farmers, so I didn't really learn much about farming as a trade, though I did learn all manner of things that you learn as a young boy uh, running through the fields and the creeks of a farm in Kentucky. So that was definitely beneficial and advantageous. Uh, and what eventually drew me back to Kentucky, I believe, the sound of the crickets and the tree frogs late at night, a uh, sound that I'll never forget and always love. Um, so I graduated Metcalf County High School in 95. I uh, went to Western Kentucky University um, after some time traveling out west. I graduated uh, from Western in 2005 with a BA in Economics and minors in Communications and Marketing. Uh, still at this point in my life, zero experience in agriculture. Um, I then moved out to Lake Tahoe for several years. I found my way out to Hawaii uh, for about a year and it was there in Hawaii that I think I can trace back to uh, picking avocados off the ground because that's when they're actually ripe is when they fall from the tree and harvesting bananas and mangoes, uh, putting those in my smoothies each day, um, catching fish and making fresh ceviche. I think that experience I had always loved to cook. I always loved making food and eating food and I think that was the first experience where I actually participated in the gathering or growing of my own food. And after about a four hour conversation one Sunday when I still lived in Hawaii with my mom who was back in Kentucky, 
Um, basically, we came upon the conclusion that I wanted to come home to Kentucky and learn how to farm. Very vague notion, had no idea what that even meant or how it was gonna happen, but that started in motion the wheels uh, that eventually brought me back home. Um, so in 2011, I came back to Kentucky, spent a little time in Nashville, uh, bar managing um, where I met my now wife, Michelle. She was the first bartender I hired at the time in, in Bowling Green. And then I started Beachmont Farms in 2013. So I had a friend who had some land real close to Bowling Green and we started a diversified uh, market operation there. We had three acres of produce at any given time, two high tunnels. Uh, we had pasture uh, raised pigs, we had pastured uh, egg layers, uh, broilers, we had honeybees, we put in one acre of blueberries, we developed an online cooperative CSA, uh, we sold at markets in Nashville as well as Bowling Green and we co-founded Beach Bend Indoor Farmers Market in that three and a half year period. So that was a really good deep dive and immersion uh, going from very little or zero knowledge about agriculture into uh, a full-blown experience. Um, from that, uh, we had uh, the experience uh, to invite West Six down to a farm table dinner we were doing in Bowling Green and they told me they just bought a farm in Frankfurt. I interviewed for that position as a farm manager to start the West Six farm in Frankfurt. So I uh, got that job in 2016 and had the pleasure of doing that for about four years. It's an agritourism venue so I moved away from food production into kind of an agritourism. Uh, but that also came with 401ks and salary and uh, benefits which were very foreign to uh, most farming operations and it was a nice chance to kind of kick back learn some other skills, uh, design and planted orchards and hop yards and some fun things like that. Um, and in 2020 of November, that was my last time I worked with West Six, and my wife and I and a couple friends uh, broke off and we started uh, planning for uh, what is now Locals Food Hub and Pizza Pub in uh, February of 20, uh, 2021. And of course that was post pandemic. Um, and we all experienced the empty grocery store shelves uh, we saw what many of us know to be true, uh, existing fragilities in a globalized um, supply chain for food as well as manufactured goods and everything else, uh, which has always been there. Those fragilities, fragilities exist in, in a just-in-time inventory system, which we live in now, which is very efficient, but the opposite of resilient. Uh, and so it was good for the American population in some ways to really see that and feel that viscerally, understand what that meant when you can't have food in your own supply chain at home. And of course, as many of you all realized uh, who do produce food, uh, there was a spike in demand, uh, unlike anything we've seen in a long time, uh, which is what we think should always be the case. Um, and so that kind of led us to um, develop the concept for Locals Food Hub and Pizza Pub, which essentially has three main goals. Uh, we want to increase viable and consistent markets uh, to farmers. We want to increase the accessibility of food to all members of our community. And we want to create a gathering space where people come together over food. So those are really essentially our three main goals uh, for Locals Food Hub and Pizza Pub. Um, in addition to that, we, uh, my wife and I bought a 75 acre farm uh, in August of 2020. Uh, so just before we kind of started planning for uh, locals and uh, we have a very small uh, commercial um, forest raised hog operation. And uh, if you came in last night, we actually have some of our pig uh, in the form of Italian sausage uh, in our kale sausage soup and our, our pizzas as well right now. We're about to have our, uh, some of our retail cuts in the freezer as well. So that's always fun to go full circle with that. Uh, my wife, uh, she helped us out in Bowling Green quite a bit on all manner of things when we were farming down there. And uh, she was recently the manager at the Franklin County Farmers Market prior to us starting Locals. So that just gives you a little uh, background into who we are and kind of how we came to this position. Uh, you see how much enthusiasm and, and happiness I had standing over a bed of what looks like maybe arugula uh, at the time. And I think that was maybe the beginning of that journey. And after three and a half years of that, I was pretty tired, um, as many of you can understand. Um, so why locals? Why now? Uh, you know, as I touched on, um, it, you know, it seemed like a very good time to really focus on a food-based business, uh, given all of the things that uh, COVID had exposed in our food system. Um, you know, the opportunity to open a place that kind of brings together all of the experiences that we had had up to this point that allows it to be easier for people to buy local food. Essentially, locals, that is our slogan, local food made easy. We're open seven days a week. 
Um, we are a, a kind of a hybridized concept where we almost have two businesses within under one roof. And so on the restaurant side, we offer locally sourced wood-fired pizzas, salads, and appetizers. Uh, every beer that we offer is from Kentucky Brewery. Every wine we offer is from Kentucky Winery, and most of our non-alcoholic beverages are also Kentucky produced. We are doing that to promote the producers in Kentucky. Um, that is our main goal. And uh, then on the grocery side, every single product that we have in our grocery side, it's about a 500 square foot retail grocery, is from a Kentucky producer. That's all we ever carry. That's all we ever will carry in our grocery. Uh, the reason for that is we're um, trying to educate consumers on the breadth and depth of product, which is available in Kentucky. And so if you go into our food hub right now uh, in Frankfurt on Wilkinson Boulevard, you will see that there's a nice variety of products that are there, even though it's January in Kentucky, uh, because of season extension growing, because of just the amazing skill level that most of our producers, especially those who've been doing it for quite some time, have achieved uh, with season extension high tunnels and all the things. Um, so we're trying to introduce, let's, let's just assume that there's 1%, and I like to throw out some numbers, but don't ever quote me on them. I'm just going to pull them out of the air, but they're generally fairly close. But let's assume that 1% of the average population in the United States consistently and regularly purchases or participates in local food. Um, what we want to do with beer and pizza being the gateway, if you will, to attract and bring people into the fold, because everybody loves beer and pizza, uh, we want to bring them in the store, uh, we want them to purchase beer and pizza, and then by default, without them maybe even knowing, they are now a local food consumer because we use Kenny's mozzarella on our cheese, or on our pizzas, we are selling a West Six beer, any number of other fine breweries throughout the state. Um, we use Valley Spirit mushrooms for our mushrooms on our pizza, we're using uh, local um, you know, forest raised Italian sausage on our pizza, etc, etc, etc. We use pretty much 10 months of the year. Um, Salad Days and Rough Draft Farmstead, both certified organic growers, amazing. Uh, we use their lettuce mix in our salads. Um, so, you know, that's the extent to which we're sourcing local. Any chance that we can or have, we do that, right? So now when people come in, buy a salad, buy an appetizer, whatever it is, uh, they are now purchasing local. And our hope is that in the 15 minutes that they wander around with their beer, they go over to the food hub side, to our grocery, and they begin to make connections. Maybe those are big connections all at once and they purchase $100 and then they do that once a week from now on. That's awesome. Or maybe they're little bitty connections. Maybe they're just awarenesses that they may have where they read a label and realize, oh wow, that farm's just down the road. That's interesting. Um, and, and so at least then there's, maybe there's a light bulb that goes off. Maybe there's some connection made because we have to bring that 1% of the population, if we'll use that number, if we were to bring that up to two, three, or five percent of the population who consistently and regularly purchase local food, imagine the increase in demand at three or five x. Imagine the new entrance into the market and the production side that that would allow, or the or the new markets or the expansion of existing markets for producers who have been doing it for a long time. Uh, so that's our goal. That's what we're geared for. Uh, that's what we're trying to do. Um, So, you know, it's funny because we developed a spiel, and it's kind of very similar to what I just told you about the appetizers on that side and the grocery side being all Kentucky. We didn't have that spiel when we first opened, and what we noticed is people would come in and check us out, and, and they would look up, and they wouldn't see Bud Light, and then they'd look over, and they wouldn't see any Diet Pepsi, and they'd see a 12-inch pizza's 18 bucks, and basically by the time they got to the counter service to order, they were already pissed off at us. And we're like, well, that's, that's not good. That's not helping out our mission here. Um, so we quickly had to develop this 10 second spiel about what we do and why we're here, right? And so now what we find when we do give that spiel to people is that they come in and before they've ordered a single thing, they're standing there, we get the reaction that I love this place, I love this concept. You know, I need one of these in my town because Buffalo Trace is just down the road. Probably 20% of our business is from out of state from bourbon tourism, which is pretty incredible. Um, and so, you know, that resonates with people. I think people want that. I think they now more than ever, they want to connect with their food. They want to understand where it's coming from, but people won't do things if they're not easy to do typically, you know? Uh, and so we want to try to help incentivize them, make it easy to buy local food. Uh, and so that's why we're open seven days a week and, and we kind of have the model that we've chosen. Um, 
So by the numbers, uh, this is a banner that we had. Actually, this banner is now turned into kind of a permanent fixture on our wall. Some of you may have noticed it last night if you were there. But basically, uh, what the updated numbers, not the banner says, that was kind of the initial one, but what our updated numbers currently are, in a year and a half of operation, through the end of uh, 2022, we purchased over $450,000 from 120 different Kentucky producers to satisfy both our restaurant and our grocery side. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. You know, that's what drives us. That's why we exist. That's why we're doing what we do, because we are trying to make an impact on local farmers and being able to buy their goods and get it out there, right? We want to increase demand. So that's exactly why we're here. Um, you know, we chose the restaurant and the grocery model because 75% of our gross revenue comes from the restaurant side. That allows us to cash flow the side on the grocery store, which is 25% of our sales in general. Um, that is a necessary element for us in that model to be able to survive. If we just had the grocery store, uh, you know, we probably wouldn't be able to pull that off. There has to be some kind, it seems in general, from folks I've talked to in the grocery space, the local food space, that there has to be some other kind of an element to help subsidize or support that grocery side if it's focusing heavily on local food. Local food is priced at a real market price, free market capitalism, that is displayed nowhere better than on the shelves of our grocery store, in a farmer's market, in a CSA or wherever, right? That is an unsubsidized, true cost of food that a real family, a small operation needs to have to survive, right? Uh, unlike in the big box stores where there's heavily subsidized commodity-based products there. And so that's what we're up against. It's really challenging. We have an $8 uh, gallon of milk, almost $9 now, from Legacy Dairy out, in, out of Barron County, right? It's amazing milk from an amazing uh, small family, veteran-owned dairy, right? Um, that's a great story, that's a great product, we want to support that, but we literally, when we first opened, had people who would come in and become irate in seeing these prices. And how do you, in 30 seconds or less, explain what a $428 trillion farm bill looks like and why prices are the way they are, right? How do you how do, you do that? Uh, we, we're still trying to figure that out. Um, so that's why we do what we do, um, you know, and we we want to try to bring more people into that fold in some way. That's, that's a big part of the, the restaurant side or what we would call the pub side. As I mentioned, 25% of our gross revenue comes from the hub. Um, you know, what we do in there is we try to focus on the quality aspect because that's exactly what differentiates us from large uh, corporate operations and big box stores and the products they offer. Um, I think we probably all had the experience where you go into a big box grocery store and you buy something highly perishable and fresh and within a day or two it's literally dripping or rotting in your fridge uh, and you understand that there's no quality necessarily as far as a focus there, right? We do have quality as a focus as local producers. That's our biggest advantage. We sell highly nutrient-dense food. The nutrient density of the food, the bricks content is directly correlated to the amount of shelf life that food has and, of course, directly correlated to the amount of immune support it can give your body when it's consumed, right? So that's the biggest advantage that we have. Uh, one thing that we do on our retail side and our grocery is we will designate sort of a day shelf life value for every product we have. So let's say Jesse from Rough Draft brings in a bag of lettuce mix and we set that on the shelf. We know that's going to last at least 14 days, if not longer, before it starts to yellow or, or begin to, to lose its quality. So we're going to give it, everything we try to do is give it a full week in the consumer's refrigerator. So we'll give that seven days on our shelf before we pull it off. Um, that's challenging because that means you're going to be eating a lot more of that highly perishable produce. But the advantage in our model where we have a restaurant and a grocery together is that we change our menu in the restaurant twice a year. We have a very, basically whenever we came to a crossroads of a decision to make, we always chose let's go simple because inherently and by definition this concept is, is very complicated even at its base level. So our simple idea was, well we have a winter menu and we have a summer menu. Our winter menu expresses kale and winter squashes and root vegetables and potatoes and, and soups and broths and different things. And our summer menu is really heavy on basil and tomatoes and, and all those fun things, right? So we kind of change that each year. Um, 
but that lettuce mix, once we pull it at day seven off of our retail shelf, at day eight or day 10 or, or day 12, as long as it's still high quality, that's going directly into a salad, which is being ordered off the restaurant side. So that ability to be able to transfer product from the grocery into a prepared food operation is critical to being able to do that in a meaningful way where you're not losing money and, and uh, giving away a lot of produce. So that's, uh, that's critical to what we do. Um, as far as our supply chain goes, we uh, have developed a supply chain all over the state of Kentucky. Um, we get our mozzarella cheese and our milk from Legacy Dairy uh, down in Barron County. Um, you know, we, we try to reach as far as we can if we need to to find the product, but we also, when we first opened, before we actually opened the doors, the very first place we sent a letter to was the Franklin County Farmer's Market and said, this is what we're doing. Uh, we'd love for you all to be a part of this, anybody that wants to find an additional market or is looking for this, just let us know. Um, and that's the thing, the wholesale market, and I'll, I'll go ahead and call ourselves wholesale, I guess, uh, because producers probably give us 20 or 30% off of what they may be selling it for direct to consumer themselves. Um, you know, that's not for everybody. If you are a small enough operation and you are able to sell every product that you can grow at the highest retail value direct to consumer for yourself, keep doing that. That is absolutely where you need to be. But if you are a larger operation or you're looking to expand your markets and you've exhausted your retail sales and you're looking for those wholesale markets or additional product to move, then we're definitely a potential option for you. Um, so we work with growers who are established and have markets and CSAs everywhere and all these types of things all the way down to a backyard grower who is not even in this for the money but they have a surplus of um, you know, green peppers and they'll reach out to us and say, hey, I've got a bumper crop of this, right? Uh, we do that because we want to be able to help and benefit any grower and every grower that we possibly can. That being said, the 80-20 rule applies to almost everything in some uncanny way, uh, but I would say that 80% of our product comes from 20% of our growers, uh, just because that's just the way it works out. And typically, you know, being part of our supply chain, the people that we will purchase from the most are the people who are on top of invoicing, who send us pick and product lists without being reminded on a weekly basis, who are just ahead of the game in that sense to where they are making our job as easy as possible because what I do, so basically, you know, we divvy responsibilities within our business uh, among me and my wife and some of our more lead uh, positions, but my responsibility is the entire kitchen side, a kitchen manager, if you will, to manage that produce and make sure quality and, and train that team and everything else to where that's always coming out consistent and good. Uh, and then I make all of the orders from local food suppliers for both the grocery and for the kitchen. And so that's kind of my uh, responsibility. And um, the challenge there is I'm sending out 30 emails a week on average, probably 30 emails looking for certain products. Then I'll get a bounce back yes, we have this, but we don't have that, and then we'll place orders and I'll crunch numbers about what we sold last week or what's our running average or year-over-year -year sales or any number of metrics we use to determine what we need to buy. Um, there is so much complexity and so much time that goes into, uh, that I have to devote to that process every single week. Um, and typically we do all of our inventory on Monday, and so I begin to crunch all those numbers by Monday afternoon, and I'm sending out emails of what we need to order by uh, Monday afternoon, Monday evening, and then into a couple days. People deliver on different days throughout the week. But my point in saying that is simply that the more, the easier that the producer can make it for someone in my position, the more likely I am to buy from them. And that's not spiteful and it's not anything else, it's just reality. It just simply makes it easier for me. And if a lot of times somebody will shoot me an email or I have this or I have this and I'm like, oh great, that's perfect. You know, and I'll buy it right then and there. Um, so that's just kind of part of being our supply chain. Um, you know, one thing that we did, especially, I think we weren't sure when we first opened because there, you know, wasn't necessarily a model exactly like what we're doing. There's other things that are similar. Uh, but we weren't sure of what amount of product we could aggregate and how much we could have on ourselves at any given time. We knew uh, tomatoes, corn, and, and all the fun things in the summer, there'd be no problem finding all those. Uh, but as you get into the, sp the spring and the fall and the winter and these different times, we weren't sure. Um, and so the strategy there was to find three producers of every single product. So if, if I need mushrooms because they're on our pizza and we sell them in our grocery, then I want to have three different producers because I'll call one one week and they're like, oh, it's cold weather kind of set us off or I'm cleaning out my grow room, whatever it is. And I call the second one, call the third one, and I can usually find that product to satisfy our needs. So 
uh, that's kind of part of how we handle that. Um, so any questions so far? I don't want to just be the one talking the whole time, uh, but you know, I'm just trying to share relevant information. Does anybody have any questions on anything that I've talked about so far? No? as far as certified organic, non-GMO. Um, so if there's an actual certification for it, so for instance, we will put, um, let me move on to the next slide, this will show you here. Um, so if you can see there, you may or may not be able to actually, but on those shelves, you have several different uh, farms logos, and then we have their price right below those, and then we have USDA organic stickers that we will put for anybody who's certified organic. Other than that, uh, if there's a certification, we will represent that, but we don't ever, and we make it a policy not to speak to the growing methods or the techniques of any given farm because if it can't be verified, we're not going to try to uh, speak to that. We basically just give them the information of the farm and kind of let them, let the consumer reach out to them and, and get that information because we don't want to be in a libel or a misinformation kind of a situation at all. But if there's certification, you know, we proudly put USDA stickers, organic stickers on any product because that, you know, adds value and differentiates why why we're there on that product. You mentioned how much time it takes. How many hours a week would you say you spend just doing those local sourcing? Just doing the orders, essentially. Uh, it, <laughs> what was that? I didn't hear that. Siri. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Siri, how many hours do I spend each week? <laughs> I, you know, it varies week to week. Um, but I would say, because there's a whole crunching of numbers and an order analysis that I have to do, which basically looks like going in to see how many units per week we're selling of this given thing, uh, how many we now have on hand based on our inventory, and therefore how many I'm going to predict we're going to need to buy for this week. And then you take into account events like Oak, you know, threw it all out of the water, which was great because uh, we had some good sales from this and, uh, and just other things like that. But I would say on average 10 hours is, is a fair one to say, uh, sometimes less, sometimes more. But that's a significant portion of my week for sure. And that's me moving through it pretty fast and being comfortable with it at this point. Um, you know, and it's interesting. So uh, one thing, I guess I'll, I'll touch on this a little bit farther down, um, but it's relevant now, so we'll talk about it. So I think the answer to that for me to make that doable, especially as we look to expand and we look to kind of grow our operation, uh, which I'll talk about here in a minute, is something similar to a software like an e-local uh, food marketplace um, where basically I'm the, I'm the consumer and if we can ask and we can train all of our producers to upload product and pricing lists, lists to this each single week, uh, say on a Sunday or a Monday morning, um, then I can simply go into that and in one glance I can look at all of the products available no matter what they are and kind of price compare and see how many units of one somebody has and whatever else. That for me is kind of the end game. That's our next, next step. Um, and that's what we need to do. You know? And I don't want to create a system that's too complicated that will actually disincentivize producers from participating in it. But at the same time, I don't know if there's another way to really expand or grow and uh, not do that because that, that's super valuable to me. And that also kind of tells you that separates the, the curds from the way in the sense of you know the people who are highly motivated and organized and everything else, and those are the people you want to work with, those are the ones who are going to take the time and, and you know, put that product up there so that you can then uh, make those decisions and everything else, right? Um, so I think, that's, I think that's the way of the future as far as that goes. All right, um, branding your product. So just want to talk a little bit about this. You know, uh, a lot of us are used to selling at farmer's markets where your only logo or maybe your only brand is your banner or something you have on your table, uh, but things can be bunched and, and put out in a beautiful display and, and hopefully they're mostly gone by the end of the day. Uh, and it's a little bit different where we are. You know, the building that we have, um, it was a gas station previous to, prior to us buying it, and it had an existing walk-in cooler that has seven glass front doors on it, which in the old days were filled with racks full of soda pop and whatever else in there. Uh, but now they're filled with things like this, all kinds of greens and cheese and, and milk and all kinds of stuff. So that was a really neat existing infrastructure item that was there. Uh, and of course it crashed within like a month of us uh, up and running. So we're wheeling carts over to our other walk-in. Luckily we had one. 
uh, and all that kind of fun stuff. But uh, $10,000 later, that was all good. Um, and so, you know, but it's really neat to see your product in there, especially in juxtaposition, uh, kind of like they were mentioned at the food stop uh, presentation, uh, to other products, you know, in, in branding and logos, that becomes a really important thing for consumers to kind of differentiate your product. Um, and so you see on here, um, we have some products uh, and some producers who do have uh, stickers and logos and things and some who don't and, and that's okay we still buy from from anybody but when it comes to how much we buy and if we sell through a given product and therefore if we buy more of that product back all these little details really help the consumer make that decision or that choice uh, so branding your products really important um, rough draft you know once you take a look at that on the left there uh, that's just a nice close-up shot of some of their products their carrots and and their kale and other things and, and they're kind of a, I brag on them a lot just because they're on point and they're just really easy to work with and they understand a lot of these complexities and nuances. Uh, but they have a label printer that has their logo on it. They have the USDA certified organic on that label. Uh, now they have barcodes on that label as well that we've asked, we've reached out to several of our growers and asked if they could put barcodes to again reduce kind of that time that we're putting into that back end as far as tracking that. Um, and so all of those little steps for us are just so huge. Uh, before they make a delivery, they actually send an invoice online. And so that's sitting in our inbox before they even show up, which is a huge deal because sometimes you have to track down invoices from people after they drop off and it could be even a month and they send you one and it's 600 bucks. And you're like, whoa, that doesn't help the cash flow. You know, so all those little things are, are super important. And we're committed and glad to sit down and work with growers and kind of explain this kind of thing to them. Uh, but just in general, you know, part of part of this is trying to help you all, uh, educate you all about what it's like to work with a grocery store or with a restaurant or something like that. You know, the more things you can do on your end, uh, the more sales you're likely going to have because the more likely they're going to buy that product. Um, so that's branding your products. Um, product inventory and pricing. So um, as I mentioned basically growers right now they send me a pick list on Sunday or Monday and so I look at that this is just an example of one it has all the information that kind of helps me it is an email uh, and that's how we do it now until we transition to what I talked about uh, to more advanced software uh, but this is it mixed lettuce 290 each that's a third pound like all that information in a glance is super easy for me to see um, all of that on there and so basically what we'll do is I'll look at that um, I'll say okay we'll take 15 bags of this I'll take 10 pounds of the mixed lettuce in bulk bags for the kitchen side you know we get two different invoices from those producers then because we separate that and track it for Kentucky development ag program by local program um, so that's helpful because we get a little reimbursement back each year from that uh, but that's just kind of an idea of what it looks like, what they want to send me, and what I like to see in my inbox when it comes to the time we've just done our inventory and we start making orders. That just helps me make real quick, fluid decisions and save some time. Um, so as far as prices go, uh, price makers and price takers I have up there. So what we do, and we've kind of done this from the very beginning, uh, we're here to support the farmer. Um, never once, to my memory, um, has somebody called me and said, hey, you know, I need $5 a pound for this. And I've said, I'll give you three, right? I'm not in the business to be chopping somebody down on the price. I'm based all of my actions on the assumption that that farmer or that producer knows their costs and they know what they need. They know their profit margins they need to have to stay viable and stay in business. Because at the end of the day, we exist so that we can help farmers grow their markets, grow their business, uh, help grow that local food movement. And that's not going to happen if I'm uh, trying to cut people down on their price. Basically what we'll say is I can do that or I'm sorry I can't do that. You know that's too high for me. Um, so that's kind of how we make that. So we are kind of price takers in that sense. You know because again that's the only way that we can kind of really help you all uh, understand that. Now I am glad to share other producers uh, prices with somebody if there's ever a question or something like that or I, I have no problem being full disclosure and saying you know I, I understand you need to have that for that. Um, right now I'm paying a range of 10 to pound to 14 a pound. We can accept that, but 16 is, I just can't do it. 
you know, and that's fine, you know, and that's the kind of relationship I try to build with them just so they understand. So maybe if they're thinking in their head, well, you know, maybe I'm only taking 10% off of this from what I'd sell it to retail, maybe I can squeeze a little more to be, you know, expanding markets, you know, that's something I want the information so they can make those choices. But in general, we're here to help support them and we will pay the price that they ask if we can afford to do so. Anybody have any questions so far? Okay. Uh huh. Could you repeat the question, please? No, the comment it was mentioning the local food marketplace. They have the software that he's looking for to use. Right. Um, exactly. And Franklin County Farmers Market also used that software, um, and they actually used it. The customers were actually real paying customers. Uh, but what that does, that saved the manager much time because that allowed the producers to kind of p upload all of their product, put the onus on them. They could put the price that they needed to have for that. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a super uh, good idea to use that. Um, okay, uh, so that's inventory and pricing. Uh, like I said, so what we do on the grocery side is we typically will take a product and we'll mark it up between 1.5 and 1.67. So what that means is if we're buying... Uh, two dollars a pound for squash we're gonna sell it at three or three twenty five a pound uh, meats we've capped at 1.5 so if we buy a six dollar a pound sausage we're selling at nine dollars a pound uh, we do that because uh, th we think that's kind of an acceptable threshold that the consumer can afford and that is the minimum that we can accept from to pay for fixed costs and that employees labor and all of the perishable uh, potential for that item and all the things that we accept once we purchase that product. We did, as far as consignment goes, which was also interesting with the food stop uh, folks about how they do everything on consignment. Um, we, you know, we've tried that with a couple different producers, but what we found was at the end of the day, the amount of time that we took accounting for and going back over reports of how much we sold, it was far more advantageous for us to simply buy it outright and then it's ours to, to manage properly or sell properly at that point versus this retroactive uh, effect of trying to track who was sold and what was sold when. And we do realize that we make mistakes because our inventory is consistently off by a fairly small percentage. And that's typically uh, one of our food hub attendants will uh, ring in a tomato that m maybe is one farm's but they thought it was another farm's. And so that throws off our inventory. If we were in a consignment system, that would actually short the farmer as well, which is kind of challenging, you know. So basically we just learned to oversimplify everything and by doing that you simply purchase the product and then you try to manage through your numbers and your predictions and forecasts and everything else uh, how to move that product. And we've recently started putting out um, a sales flyer once a week. So for all of our uh, newsletter customer or newsletter uh, signups and stuff like that, uh, we send out kind of more of a story newsletter with, with important information about who's playing the band this weekend and uh, you know some kind of feature little piece about something interesting and that goes out on Friday but every Tuesday we started doing just what is a sales newsletter that's it there's no verbiage uh, it's just product pricing farm and what the price was and what the price is now and we've gotten a really good response from that being able to move products especially if they're kind of nearing an end of shelf life date or something like that uh, and, and we find that people are obviously love sales um, and so they will kind of come in and buy products where maybe they wouldn't have before. And so it's a good way for us to move some products, especially if it's getting close to being perishable. Um, so ordering and aggregation. This is, you could probably see that okay. This is just an example of one of the spreadsheets that I've created. Um, you know, and, you know, this is just here to kind of show you that process of that 10-hour process and what that looks like, basically. I'll run down the list. And we will we kind of designate whether that's me or somebody else who's responsible for ordering that product. Um, we'll go down the list and we will just say, this is when we ordered it. Have we heard a response back? Yes, we have. We'll fill in if it's going to be delivered, if it's going to be picked up by us. Uh, that, that's kind of the only way I can track and any helpful notes off to the side of how that works. Um, you know, so this is interesting, but... You know, aggregation and delivery, if we have a choice, if, if somebody wants to deliver to us, that is always 
uh, preferred all day long. Uh, most people who deliver to us will tack on a nominal fee, $6, if they're not coming too far, or maybe longer or more if they're coming from Louisville. And we accept that, and we'll just build that into the price of the product uh, to try to recoup that cost. Um, but that, for us, is super helpful uh, because we don't have necessarily the ability to continuously go out and drive and pick up and aggregate uh, product from, from other uh, producers. Uh, that being said, we have some really interesting uh, kind of aggregation arrangements. So... For instance, every Thursday, I drive to Circle K gas station in Shelbyville to meet uh, Doug the Milkman from Legacy Dairy, who drops off not only my weekly order of milk and chocolate milk that we get from him, but he's kind enough and gracious enough when he makes his delivery in Barron County two miles from Kenny's Cheese the day before to pick up my order that I've made with Kenny's Cheese and store it in his refrigerated truck overnight and bring me not only his milk, but Kenny's cheese as well. Um, does that feel very fragile? Yes, it does. Uh, do I sit heavy on two weeks worth of inventory of cheese at any given moment because a pizza place can never run out of cheese? Yes, I do. Is that expensive cash flow tied up? Yes, it is. Um, but that's an interesting example of, of just one example of what we do. I drive into Lexington every three weeks on average and we will try to order from Great Bagel who provides a third of our flour, uh, fresh stone ground organic flour. Uh, we will buy from Bees Berries out of Berea because they will drop off at Food Chain as kind of a central point. Food Chain is amazing and they've become kind of our central point of aggregation. Um, Sunflower Sundries coming from Paris will drop her chips and uh, value added goods. Uh, we'll stop at Boone Creek Creamery to get their cheese. We use their blue cheese in our salad. So basically, we'll go to Lexington Pasta. We'll go to Backroads Bakery, and that's the cheesecake that's actually on our menu because she makes phenomenal cheesecake. So basically, we'll try to put eight orders in for a given day or whatever it is so that we can maximize the cost of me driving there and the gas and the time and try to scoop up as much product as we possibly can. Um, so that's one thing. And, you know, something I'm super excited about um, is that we are, um, I'll go ahead to this next one here, um, delivery, packaging, fulfillment, I'll just kind of follow along this train of thought, so we did receive, and I'll talk just briefly about that here in a little bit, let me check my time, um, so it looks like I've got about five more minutes, and then I'll try to open it up for some questions. Um, but basically, uh, we won a local food promotion program grant from the USDA for $400,000, which is super exciting. We wrote that grant for the Frankfurt store to develop a home grocery delivery service, um, especially focused in underserved neighborhoods. Um, and so there's also an aggregation component to that. There's a value added component to that. So that's actually going to pay for the coordinator of the program that pays for the delivery or the, uh, the lease on the refrigerated truck, the driver's wage, the value added uh, extra prep help to create value added items to mitigate loss that we have. There's lots of exciting things there. Uh, we're just starting to implement that, which is really exciting. But that means that we can now have a driver with a refrigerated truck who can begin to go around and pick up products from these various places, which again, only helps to facilitate the producers to sell hopefully more of their product to us and us to reach out a little bit farther to be able to make a bigger impact. So that's super exciting. Uh, we're, we're really excited about that. Um, but the ordering and the aggregation, you know, that really is the biggest challenge of what we have. Uh, this is just an example, uh, you know, so my background as a farmer was super helpful in growing vegetables and lettuce and all these different things too because I have a, a relationship with the growers who we purchase from and they understand that I have an understanding of product and quality of product and what that means and what post-harvest handling means and if something shows up in a bag like this and, and it kind of looks green and a little off within two or three days I understand that that's not on us that that's some issue that I will gladly call them and in a very polite and, and kind and professional way explain to them what is happening with their product on our shelf and that we're going to pull it off and that you know, we would hope to have a refund or a replacement for that product. Um, you know, sometimes we've got some um, greens in a, in a vented bag, and it wasn't intended, but it was, you know, just a mix-up on the packing side of some farm, and so we call them, and they apologize, and they send product at back or a rebate, right, because uh, those greens wilted within two days in the fridge. So, you know, that's that part on the producer side is super important to think about, too, just as far as the quality of product that you're bringing us. Um, you know, we... 
there, there's definitely times when we know we've gotten product that's not fresh or not harvested that day. And, and at the end of the day, that might make for a sale or two, but it won't make for a long-term relationship with us, you know. And so we'll, we begin to identify people who understand that and understand that quality. All right, so invoicing payments. Uh, just kind of breeze through this real quick. So we, uh, online is always the best. You know, we will write checks to people on demand. We do that for our firewood supplier. We do that for all kinds of suppliers. Uh, but in general, the people are consistent and regular and we're uh, buying a lot of product from them. They send us a square online invoice or a QuickBooks invoice online and that's super easy for us. Uh, that's the way we like to track that. Um, what's next for local food? Uh, so our second location in Louisville is what's next for us. We're super excited about that. Uh, we did win a Healthy Food and Financing Initiative grant for $200,000 also in 2022. So we won two federal grants that year, which is super exciting for us. What that also tells us is that our, our model resonates not only with our customers and, and, and whatnot, but it resonates with the people of the federal government who are understanding food supply issues, underserved community uh, challenges with fresh food, uh, resiliency in the food chain, et cetera, et cetera. So that feels good that we're kind of on the right track there and they're verifying that by giving us this money. So we wrote that grant specifically for, um, and it can be used for construction costs and things that a lot of grants can't be. Uh, we wrote that for a second location in Louisville because we've always known that this store in Frankfurt, which actually is a very small market in Frankfurt, and it's a very small town. Um, you know, we would not have opened this store, this business in Frankfurt, if we didn't all live here. But we do, and we love Frankfurt, and it's, you know, it's a good place to be. That said, this has always been a prototype for us, so we could kind of develop systems and begin to figure out what works and what doesn't in a smaller market where there's less to lose or the, ex the mistakes are less expensive, uh, where we can really hone in our systems uh, and get key people in place before we kind of try to go into a larger market. So uh, we signed a lease with a developer in Smoketown, which is about two blocks north of Logan Street Market in Louisville, for those of you who are familiar with that area. Uh, we're really excited about this. Um, there's still a lot of uh, things we have to figure out with the partner, but they're wanting to build a building from scratch for us. We've already met with the architect and we've submitted a second rendition um, of what that plan's gonna look like. Our current footprint's about 3,000, 3,200 foot. Uh, the one we're looking at in Louisville uh, to be built is gonna be about 4,500 feet, and we actually have the input in where things need to go and all these little logistical quirks that you're, you're forced to endure in a place that you're retrofitting, but we don't necessarily have to there. That's super exciting. That's gonna hit our food access goals. That's gonna hit uh, our goals to impact more farmers and sell more food there. Um, there's just lots of things that are really exciting about that. So that's one thing that's next for us. Um, and then of course, as I mentioned, the local food promotion program grant for the Frankfurt store that's really gonna help kind of push that product out to underserved communities and uh, residents all over Frankfurt using an e-commerce platform online. Really interesting story, Kroger, uh, they opened their first location recently in Florida, which is a Publix domain, so a highly competitive area, but Kroger finally entered that marketplace. They entered it with a building that has no retail access whatsoever. It's a massive warehouse with robots and delivery vehicles, which is really interesting. And so when you think about the largest grocery chain in the entire world is reading the metrics and seeing what people are doing and where the market's at, it's online. Uh, I'm excited to, you know, begin to develop our own tiny little version of an online e-commerce platform where people can go order groceries and have them delivered to their house in Franklin County. So that's, that's really exciting for what's next there. Um, okay, so that kind of concludes what we're doing and kind of selling to the, this little part of it. I know that we are uh, about 12 minutes from being wrapped up here. Uh, I tend to go a little bit long. Does anybody have any questions on those technical kind of fundamental things if you're looking to grow into those markets or anything else? Yep. Did you write your grant yourself or did you work through Pay Card or what? Great question. So we actually used Upwork. Uh, Upwork is, it's a site where you can find professionals to do all manner of things. Uh, we did talk to some local people about grant writing. Uh, but by going through Upwork, we found someone who had experience in agricultural grants specifically, um, and it, we just found it as a really useful service. Uh, and obviously, you know, we use the same person for both grants, and we've developed a really strong working relationship at this point. Um, KCARD will help facilitate, and they will do as much as they can within their uh, constrained or limited resources. Uh, but my experience was that, you know, we needed more help 
uh, and we needed someone to kind of take the lead because at the end of the day, my wife and I are owners and operators, and there's only so much bandwidth you have to be able to do a lot of those things. Yeah. Joni? Well, Frankfurt was probably more of an opportunity to buy a building that we could actually afford. Uh, full disclosure, we paid $125,000 for that location as it remained dormant and abandoned for a while. Um, and so we could actually do that within our budget because we were kind of bootstrapping that as a partnership and as an LLC to be able to afford that building and then retrofit and add the dining room space, which is all new construction where people sit and eat. Um, you know, it's conveniently placed next to the Housing Authority of Frankfurt. Uh, one thing I did not touch on is Local Food Forward, which is the, basically the program we created, which is anything involving food access in underserved communities uh, is under Local Food Forward for us. So we accept personal donations, we ex give 10% of the merchandise uh, from t-shirt sales and other things, and we solicit businesses to make larger donations that we have turned into $50 vouchers and give to David Small at the Housing Authority of Frankfurt, and they disseminate them to members who are most in need uh, so they help manage that. They become a partner of ours in that respect. We've also partnered with Regina Wink uh, at the uh, emergency food pantry, and we are, us, Franklin County Farmers Market and Save-A-Lot are on those vouchers, and we've redeemed, I think, $17,000 in vouchers from them, which feels really good. Um, so that's just a very small example uh, of what we're trying to do there. We're excited in Louisville to really ramp up that program. Uh, we've already talked with kind of our partner uh, developers there about them inputting money into that program. Where we see that going next is double dollars, basically creating our own double dollars program. We are not eligible for them as a grocery store right now to receive those, um, but we understand the challenges with the most nutrient dense food on the planet, which is what you all are growing and what we're selling, but it's also some of the most expensive food. And so the only way that people with reduced incomes in underserved areas can afford that food uh, is to have that subsidized. And so if we can reach out to the community to find ways to bring that price point down through the double dollars program, uh, I mean, that's basically we'll create our own in-store double dollars program is our only answer to that at this point. That's the only way we know how to effectively and meaningfully do that. And so if someone comes in based on the amount of money in that pool, um, we can offer 50 or we can offer $100. If they spend $100 in SNAP, then we'll put another $100 on it and there's $200 that they're walking out with. Yep, Adam. Uh-huh. Awesome. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. I, I think we would have to find that money through some other form of a grant uh, in Louisville store. Um, you know, doing it in Frankfurt first is, is, again, I think our way of trying to wrap our head around a smaller market because of the logistics involved in delivering e-commerce, inventory control, where somebody who buys in-store and that immediately is reflected online so you're not selling something twice. All those little things I think we're going to have to work through in the three-year grant program here in Frankfurt. But hopefully, within a year or two, we'd be able to implement the same thing in Louisville. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, it is. It is going to be the same business model where there's the restaurant and yep. there's the grocery side of it. Yeah. Uh, we found that that combination works really well so we're not going to change much there of course the layout might look slightly different and everything else but in general the concepts the same um, well not the same producers no I mean I, I think our key moving forward uh, we will definitely have overlap with some of the same producers for sure uh, but we definitely intend to establish new producer relationships in that regional general area okay and specifically as regards to highly perishable produce um, somebody's not going to want to drive an hour and a half to make a delivery or an hour even to make a delivery if it's a smaller order on perishable produce or something like that. And typically with value added goods and things that aren't as highly perishable, we'll make larger orders less often and we'll sit on that uh, inventory which kind of ties up cash flow but it makes more sense for the producer and for us 
And so we will kind of go heavier on less perishable stuff and we'll go uh, lighter orders more consistently weekly on highly perishable stuff. That's kind of how we manage that. So that by definition means that when we go to a different location, we want to source those highly perishable things from a lot closer to that general area, typically. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so mushrooms specifically, we get them in bulk at one price, and then we divide them among ourselves, right? So we'll take, we get 15 pounds, we'll put 10 over on the kitchen side because mushrooms reduce down by about half after you saute them slightly. Uh, and we try to factor for all that in our costs. And then we'll take five pounds and we'll put them into clam shells where one clam is a small three ounce and another one's a six ounce on the retail side. And so we do that with mushrooms. A lot of our producers will do that for us. So for instance, lettuce mix again, you know, they'll come in five pound bags specifically for the kitchen and then they'll come in retail bags with their logo and everything else for the retail side. Um, so they'll give us two separate invoices there. Does that answer your question? Uh, they are in that case with the lettuce mix. Yeah, because now the farmer's having to do more work to package them into different, um, different prices or, you know, different packages. Yeah, so that will reflect. So in one example, it would be $7 a pound when we're buying it wholesale or it'd be eight twenty-five a pound if they're packaging it separately. And, and so we understand that. Or we can just say, hey, we wanna, you know, we want to buy all of it at $7 a pound in big bags and then we want to pay our people the labor and will you give us extra stickers and we'll, you know, supply the bags. And, and people are open to that, but we don't necessarily want to do that, especially when we're talking about dozens of different products. We don't have the bandwidth to do that. So we would much prefer pay a little extra price uh, to justify that for the producer, and then it shows up ready to go on the shelf. Adam? Yeah, but with that product, I'm assuming the producer is GAP certified and the facility is inspected. It's a commercial kitchen that they're yes. bagging in. All that. Yes, exactly. And we ask for certification. Egg producers, same way. We get the state license. We have that on file, a copy of that, for that to be presented. 